there's nothing quite like the sound of an arcade. All that music and sound effects from different games all playing together, the darkness only broken through with the soft glow of a CRT screen. As we saw in a previous episode, actual arcade machines do seem to be a bit harder to find these days. The ones you do find in arcades, at least modern ones, are kind of based around driving games or light gun games. It seems that fewer arcade machines these days are based around joysticks and buttons. Thankfully with the opening of the arcade archive we can finally relive the nostalgia of yesteryear. This little arcade that Alex has put together is on the same site as RMC The Cave, that retro museum that's got loads of cool exhibits for you to check out. Spend a day there and visit both of them, you won't regret it. There's a great bunch of games on display here, my particular favourite out of these ones is Ghosts and Goblins. But there's loads of classics there as well. As I mentioned in that previous episode, we didn't have any arcades near us growing up. It was only really something you saw on holiday. So we never got a chance to play these arcades, but today we're going to look at what it was like when we brought the arcade home. At least with home conversions to consoles and computers, today we're going to look at some of the ones I played while growing up. See which ones held up and were really good conversions, really playable despite the limitations of the machines, and which ones were absolute stinkers. For me the best period of arcades was probably from 1985 to 1998. At home at that time we would have been playing the Sinclair Spectrum. 48 kilobytes and just a few colours on screen and an internal beeper for sound. Later on we moved on to the 128k Sinclair Spectrums, these new models gave you a bit more memory to work with so you didn't have to load multiple levels of games, and it also had a better sound chip giving you much better music. The ZX Spectrum was released in 1982, and lasted way up until 1992. This is one of the Jet Set Willy games, and if anything, the character in this game is the mascot of the ZX Spectrum I would say. Speak to people of a certain age and they will associate this character directly with the Sinclair Spectrum, even though it came out on other systems as well. You can recognise the Sinclair Spectrum game a mile off, just the style of the graphics and the sounds is immediately recognisable. And the early Spectrum games might well do good renditions of actual arcade games. Space Invaders, Asteroids, that kind of thing, they do a really good job of it. But what about more advanced arcade conversions on the Sinclair Spectrum? The Sinclair ZX Spectrum was fairly basic in its specifications. Some of these more modern arcade games would be slightly cut down, but some of the more advanced ones that weren't really suited to the Sinclair Spectrum, what did they do? They had a go anyway. And sometimes with disastrous results. As we didn't live anywhere near an arcade, our only chances of hearing about these new arcades was seeing things in Spectrum magazines. You might get some details of machines coming out, or you might get an advert showing the game and different versions of it. But it's not just Spectrum versions we're going to check out, we're also going to check out the Amiga versions as well. Does more power mean more better? Not always. But first we've got to get my machine back up and running. It's got this really loose tape belt on it because it's so old, so let's start with that. Thankfully this is really straightforward to do, even someone of my ability can crack this one. Basically the tape drive belt just gets loose over time and it doesn't drive it properly, causing the problem with the loading. I've bought a new Spectrum drive belt, so let's fit it. Thankfully the Spectrum is really easy to get into, just remove a few screws and remove the ribbon cables that connect the main board to the keyboard. This lets you access the tape mechanism, and that drive belt that we need to get rid of and replace. This is probably one of the quickest and easiest repairs I've ever done. Out with the old and in with the new. There's not much to a Sinclair ZX Spectrum Plus 2 motherboard, but we all love a bit of shiny circuitry. But now we've finally got this thing repaired, so let's play some arcade games. Rolling Thunder was released by Namco way back in 1986, and this is a game I'm much more familiar with on the home systems than I am the arcade. I've never actually played the physical arcade cabinet of this game, but thanks to emulation I can play it now. The arcade game Shinobi was inspired by this game, and yeah, taking a look at it, the games aren't really that different. I really like this game though, it plays really nice and fast, gives you a good challenge and is pretty fair I'd say. You play as a spy and you've got to get your partner back. And as is tradition, you do that by blasting your enemies, picking up different weapons and taking everyone out. A great arcade game then, but let's see how the home versions did. Now it has been a long time since I played this game on the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, but I do remember really enjoying it back in the day. 
I recently picked up the full price original copy of this game, although I think back in the day I had the budget release. I'm happy to see my efforts paid off with the tape deck, the game loaded first time. We do have a bit of a warning though, at the bottom right hand corner of the screen, conversion by tier text. That is not a good sign. I've hit out at tier text before, so much so that another YouTuber, Dudley of Yesterzine, has done a couple of videos actually, really good videos, suggest you check them out, in defence of tier text on the Sega Master System. But let's see how they did on other systems. Well I'm happy to report that this game is still as much fun as I remember it. It doesn't have any in-game music and it is a little bit choppy in the movement, but still a great game and really nostalgic for me this one. I actually find it a little bit easier playing it these days, what, 25 to 30 years later. I don't know why I found it really difficult back in the day, I think even if we got to level 2 we thought we were doing well. So well done Tier Tex, you didn't balls this one up. But let's look at the Amiga version, also by Tier Tex. You see, it's garbage like this that is responsible for that reputation that Tier Tex has. How can they mess this game up so badly? The Sinclair Spectrum version is much more responsive. And why does this version of the game run so slowly? Even a bog standard Amiga 500 would have four times the memory of the Sinclair Spectrum, not to mention much better graphics hardware and sound hardware. This one's an absolute embarrassment and it's one of the worst games that Tier Tex have ever excreted onto the market. Next up is Strider, and this made my top 30 arcade games of all time. I think I first saw this on the Sega Mega Drive or Sega Genesis, I think it was quite an early game, maybe a release game, and I didn't see the arcade to much later on, but it blew me away how close it got to it, such a great conversion. But we're not dealing with the Sega version in this video, we're dealing with the Spectrum and the Amiga. And whilst there's a lot going on graphically in this game, along with a great musical soundtrack, as long as they gave it to a decent publishing house and some decent developers, surely they can't mess this up. They gave it to Teartex. This is a game I did have back in the day and I don't remember it being very good. But I have bought it again recently just for nostalgia. There's some slightly dodgy box art, but I'm sure there's some other versions that have got that. But inside the inlay, I found something that was a bit nostalgic to me. There's this offer for a head bag. Now if you were in the UK in the 80s or 90s, pretty much everyone in school had a head bag. I don't know what it was with these, but seeing this again raised a smile. I did have a bit of trouble loading this one, but that's what you get for games that are like 35 years old. You do get the odd duff tape. Thankfully I was able to load the 48k version which is on the other side of the cassette. It seems pretty much the same as the 128k version, other than a bit of music at the start and maybe one or two sounds in the game, so it's going to be pretty close. And yeah, this is standard fare tier text crap. We don't expect much out of the humble spectrum even back in the day, but we expected better than this. There's hardly any sound in the game, it's really slow, really jerky, and everything's in black and white for some reason. Surely the Spectrum can do better than this. Looking at a long play on YouTube, you don't even get the full game with this one. You don't get all the levels, you get different bosses and stuff at the end as well, so it's not even a full version of the game it's supposed to be. Yeah, I got a bit of buyer's remorse playing this one again, but hey, it's our nostalgia, it's our childhood, it's what we grew up with. Sometimes even the bad games give you good memories. So let's give this 4 toilet brushes out of 5 for effort. And yeah, they got their hands on the rights to the Commodore Amiga version as well. Now this one I did actually quite like back in the day. It was never a game we actually owned, I'm sure it was a game that just turned up on a bunch of floppy disks somewhere, as games tended to back then with piracy what it was. But yeah, this one's not a complete disaster. I actually quite like the music in this game. Sounds quite good. If only it would move a little bit faster and a little bit smoother, make the gameplay a little bit tighter, and yeah, it would be a really good version. But if you got the Genesis Mega Drive or the arcade version to play these days, why would you ever come back to this? You escape this one, Tier Tex, only just. Ghouls and Ghosts reached the number 2 spot of my top 30 arcade games of all time. And yet it really is that good. This is one of the classic arcade games that is just absolutely brilliant and it always keeps me coming back. 
It's got great soundtrack and great visuals. The game is quite difficult though, uh, a lot of people really struggle with this one. But a lot of this is based around patterns. Enemies are going to appear from the same spots and the same locations most of the time. So you will get better, it just takes a little bit of time with this one. But I find this game really really playable and it's one I keep coming back to on emulation over and over again. The Sinclair Spectrum conversion was handled by Software Creations, and what a brilliant job they've done with this one. Yeah, it might not have the graphics, but it's got all of the playability. I find this version one of the best versions to play, despite its graphical simplicity. You don't get in-game music with this one unfortunately. I've included the intro theme here, just along with the gameplay to give you an idea of it. It'd be really nice if you could choose sounds or music whilst you actually play the game, but the sounds in this game are perfectly fine. But for me, Ghouls and Ghosts is one of the best games on the Sinclair Spectrum. Small wonder then why it's going up in price so grab it while you can. When it comes to the Commodore Amiga version of this game, I'm not 100% sure where I stand. I really like the addition of the different music, it's got some really cool title music and some really interesting music in the game. However, I don't think there's an option to choose sounds, and I really, if I had to choose between the two, I probably would choose sounds over music. The graphics are okay, but the game is a little unresponsive this time, it's a bit sort of frustrating to play. Compared to that Spectrum version, alright it didn't have the graphics but it was so responsive and nice to play. I'd say go give this version a go yourself, see what you think. It's nowhere close to that fantastic Sega Mega Drive version, but it's an interesting different one. Double Dragon was probably the first scrolling beat em up that I played in the arcade. Absolutely incredible for its time, and two players at the same time. It did have a bit of slowdown when too much is going on on the screen, but it's a legendary arcade game and still fun to play to this very day. There are a few sequels and spin offs to this game, but the original, in my opinion, is still the best. So, how's the humble Sinclair ZX Spectrum going to get on trying to play this? In truth, maybe not very well. You might have heard your parents say the phrase, we had to make do with what we've got. And that's what we did with this version on the Sinclair Spectrum. But in truth, I absolutely loved this game, despite how primitive it is. Really enjoyed it, I kept playing it through and through. It is two players at the same time, no music in the game, and the sounds are next to non-existent, but I don't know, I still really, really enjoy it. Even when I played it through to get the footage for this, I played it all the way through, brought back some great memories. But equally, if you played the arcade and then played this game back in the day, you might well be forgiven for thinking, what is this old toot? The Amiga version of this game was one of the earliest Amiga games that I remember playing. It still looks pretty junk, but I remember having a lot of fun with this back in the day. What you can't get away from on this version of the game is that pretty much most of the enemies are you. They look exactly the same as you, they might have different coloured trousers or different coloured shirt, but it's the same sprite and it gets pretty old pretty fast. But still, it was Double Dragon, it was two players at the same time, and gave us an idea of the games to come. Nitro. Midnight Resistance hit the number 3 spot in my top arcade games of all time. This two player run and gun shooter is absolutely brilliant. It's not the longest game in the world, and you probably will get through it with a little bit of practice. It has some great graphics and great sounds in this game, along with a great soundtrack. And it was also the first arcade game that I'd ever played that had rotary controllers. You could move up, down, left and right, but you could also spin the controller so you could aim your gun in any direction. This lets you move one way while shooting behind you, really cool feature. But how does that translate to a one button Sinclair Spectrum or Commodore Amiga joystick? Well I think the ZX Spectrum version of this game is the best arcade conversion on the entire system. I still remember going out to pick this game up for my 10th birthday. Yeah, the graphics are nowhere near as good as the arcade, but it's got its own little cool cartoony style, the controls are really good, it's got a great musical soundtrack and all the levels of the arcade. Only downside is it's single player only. No two players at the same time in this version. Bit of a shame, but it would probably be a little bit too much for the Spectrum. Thankfully there's another excellent arcade conversion on the Commodore Amiga. And this is another early Amiga game I remember playing. Two players at the same time in this version, really good, really enjoyed playing this back in the day with my brother. 
I don't think we ever finished it despite using all the credits. I can complete the ZX Spectrum version in a single life, not getting hit once, but the Commodore Amiga version seemed to be a bit tougher. I think when it comes to this game, the best home version of this was always the Sega Genesis or Mega Drive. I think it only ever came out in Japan, but it's definitely worth getting if you can hunt it down. But be prepared to pay, because that one's going to cost you. To some extent, things are a little bit easier these days. If you want to go and buy a game, maybe you'll find a demo or a playthrough or something on YouTube, or maybe there's a free trial or demo you can download. True, you did get some demos on the front of magazines in the form of cassette tapes or Commodore Amiga discs on Amiga magazines, but a lot of the time you had to make do with the magazine itself. Take a look at a few screenshots and make the judgement. Does this game look interesting or fun to play? We paid our money and we took our chances. And a full price Spectrum cassette game would probably cost you £10, or maybe for a disc version even £15, and you just had to cross your fingers that you bought a good one. I still remember when we picked up the sequel to Chase HQ on the Sinclair Spectrum. Special Criminal Investigation I think it was called, and it was an absolute stinker. Maybe we should have known better though. One of the most applauded arcade conversions on the Sinclair Spectrum is Chase HQ. You've got to think how primitive this computer was for the time, and seeing the quality of graphics on a system and the way it played it, it just almost shouldn't have been possible. Let's take a look. Chase HQ has you trying to catch up with criminals and trying to ram them off the road in your Porsche. And it's a great arcade game and it plays really really well. Great music, great sound and great gameplay. It's really fast, really smooth and it's got some great scaling sprites in the game as well. Surely there's no way the Sinclair Spectrum could handle this. I mean, yeah, obviously it's never going to be close to the arcade, but this is an 8-bit system. What a great version this is. It's got sampled speech, sampled sound effects, it's got a really cool intro theme, and the smoothness of the graphics. I don't know how they've managed to get this power out of this little system. A lot of people actually rate this as one of the greatest Spectrum games of all time. And you can see why. It's just a game that shouldn't have been possible. The Sinclair Spectrum was always sort of suited better to a 2D experience. Platform games, things like that, the Dizzy series, 3D driving games, was never really its kind of thing. So to even get this on the system in this state, what an achievement. When it comes to the Amiga version of this game, I'm a little bit on the fence. I really like the sounds in this game. I think they've sampled a lot of it from the arcade, so it really true to life arcade sounds in this game. You do have the option to turn on the music, and the music is absolutely dreadful in this game. Really, really poor. The graphics likewise, uh, not great, and it is a little bit jerky, but the controls are actually quite good. Um, I remember really disliking this back in the day, but picking it up again now and playing it through, I quite like it. So it gets a thumbs up from me. Same Dragon's another great arcade shooter that we took a look at in a previous episode. Really high difficulty level on this one, but what a great game, and it's, in my opinion, it's got one of the best arcade soundtracks of all time. I think I got to level 2 once, <laughs> but it's a great game. Keep on trying and just try and get as far as you can. The Sinclair Spectrum version plays a little bit slower than the arcade, but it maintains every last bit of its difficulty. And what a fantastic rendition they've done of the arcade theme tune on the humble 8-bit hardware. Easily up there with one of the top 10 specy theme tunes. Yeah, you lose quite a lot of the background detail in this version, but it was the Sinclair Spectrum, we were used to it. Another great game then, but hard as nails. Thankfully the Commodore Amiga version got a lot closer to the arcade, and this is an absolutely fantastic version of the game. Retains that fantastic theme tune, along with much better graphics and much better sound. And yeah, it runs at the proper speed as well, and that never hurts. This is probably one of the greatest Amiga arcade ports in my opinion. Yeah, so we've looked at some good and some bad arcade ports in this episode for both systems. There's a lot of them I haven't included in this, but just ones that I remember playing at the time. We are kind of a bit spoilt with YouTube and other video sharing websites these days, we can take a really good look at a game before we buy it. But there's always that chance that EA Games will get their hands on it and fill it full of microtransactions and downloadable content and all this other rubbish, online activation, blech. Sometimes the old days are the best days. 
To finish up, we're going to take a look at two of the biggest stinkers of all. Because where's the fun looking at only good games? Stun Runner was released by Atari back in 1989. And if you saw this back in the day, you must have thought you'd gone to the future. Imagine this in 1989. These graphics, this speed, the smoothness of the graphics, absolutely unbelievable for the time. Racing along tunnels, some of which have even got multiple routes, shooting out bad guys and trying to make it to the end in the quickest time possible. I'd really love to play the physical arcade of this one. Never played it, I've played Hard Drive in which I think is probably built on the same hardware. It's got the same kind of feel to it. We've actually checked out Stun Runner already, in one of my earlier episodes on the Atari Lynx, and what a great conversion it is to Atari's handheld. There's a good balance of graphics, gameplay and speed on this one. I remember when I picked this game up for my own Atari Lynx back in the day, I was absolutely floored that this conversion came to this little system. So how did the other ones do? got to ask yourself why did they even bother? I'm no programmer but if I had released this back in the day I think I would be feeling pretty ashamed of myself. You wouldn't even recognise it as Stun Runner. The whole 3D world is basically gone and basically you've got yourself an epileptic fit. Even with how simple the Sinclair Spectrum is they could have done so much better than this. Why not make a world out of wireframe graphics? Would have been no problem at all and would probably have run pretty fast. This is one game I'm glad I don't have in my collection. Surely the Amiga version can't be any worse. And then it is. It's a lot worse. It's a lot worse than the Sinclair Spectrum version. You've got a frame rate of about 2 that dips to about 1 when you go into the tunnels. Absolute garbage this one. Imagine if you paid real world money for this. In the old days I think we had a backup of this on an Amiga floppy disk. And it was so crap it didn't even stay on that floppy disk. I think I taped over it with something else pretty damn quick. Yeah, it's hard to believe, but Street Fighter 2 did come to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Porting this to an 8-bit system must have been like sending a man to Mars. Fast 2D gameplay, combos, special moves, multiple characters, amazing soundtracks and sounds. It was never going to work. But like I said at the start of the video, sometimes they had a go anyway. This game's about as responsive as my cat when I tell him to stop scratching my sofa. Trying to convert six attack buttons to one joystick button? It was never going to happen. Street Fighter 2 might well have been the last commercial release for this system. I know you get some hobbyists these days that release new games, but this was the last big release, as far as I'm aware. And by this time, it was definitely time to upgrade systems. Thankfully, at this point, I did already have a Commodore Amiga myself. I, even I don't think I would have got any fun out of trying to get anything out of this game back in the day. As a technical showcase, it's kind of impressive in some ways that they've managed to retain the size of the sprites, but it's so unresponsive, this thing. Try and get some special moves out of some of the characters. It just does not happen. There's loads of missing animation frames on this one. Some characters just decide to randomly turn upside down, missing moves and things like that, but we made do with what we had. Arcade conversions and, to some extent, movie licenses were always a bit of a crapshoot on the Sinclair Spectrum. You might have got something great, you might have got something rubbish. You want to take a chance? Well open your wallet, sight unseen. But that's going to do us for this time. Hope you enjoyed this little walk back through memory lane. Let me know some of the great conversions you played back in the day. But for now, I'll see you next time.